guys and welcome to a, an Ice Age 2 birthday special because Ice Age 2 is 7 this weekend so I thought I would film a little behind the scenes video on how I do my videos. <laughs> um, loads and loads of people ask about the stuff that goes on behind the scenes so I thought I'd do a little celebratory birthday to show you. Uh, you may have you may recall that I mentioned um, ages and ages ago an Engage project I want to do called Inglenook, which is like a, a little puzzle. And uh, I'm basically going to show you the process all about that. But you'll see the editing and Photoshop stuff for this particular video, not the Inglenook. So, um, I'm I, as you can see, I'm in my bedroom at the moment. Um, there's a gap just here because, well, they're the ones that I've got on. But where, if you want to just follow me downstairs quickly. Okay, so here we are in the um, dining room. It's just been redone. It's still not 100%, but it's nearly, nearly there. So I'm just gonna turn the camera around, letting you see what I see. Here we go. So this is pretty much how every single one of my videos starts out. Not with me on Facebook, trust me. <laughs> um, right, okay. Um, so you can see here that I've already started to make some notes. Uh, ICC2 behind the scenes, Engelnock N. And um, ages and ages ago, I actually did make some notes on this. Well, I, made, I, say, I say notes, I drew a picture. Uh, come on, no, I don't want to rename it. Open up. No! Ah, oh, right. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it does look like a five year old has done it, but, <laughs> well, maybe a two year old. But um, I, I did it in a rush, okay? I just wanted to save something. Basically, uh, the Inglenock project is uh, it's like a puzzle. So it's an N gauge, well, it, it can be any gauge you want, but I'm going to make it N gauge because that's going to be the most accessible and it should be make it, it should make it more interesting, plus it will fit into a really compact space. But the Inglenut project is basically where you have like a little shunt, um, a little shunter, you have a wagon here and then a shunter here, and the object is to get that wagon from there to there. And you're not allowed to touch. Oh God, it's just, um, a touch screen. You're not allowed to touch the trains. You're not allowed to come in with the hand of guard and do anything. It's all got to be the shunter. So the shunter has to go into that siding, pull out a wagon, put it into there, grab another wagon, put it into there, put that one into there, and basically it can take something like half an hour or even more just to get one wagon from there to there. And it's supposed to be a really quirky, a really fun thing to do. And if we just do a little bit of research, if I just go back to the browser, uh, and then you start to type in, for example, um, Ingle, well, see, it, see it's come up, um, Ingle not Engage, and then hit enter. There is actually some website that comes up here right at the top called Ingle not Siding Shunting Puzzle, and it's by wyman.info.uk. Uh, so, um, obviously this looks fantastic and the person has done it in train sim and real life by the looks of it and the, oh sorry yeah you can see some like um, I can't show you too much because this isn't mine this is technically not mine but you can see there that you've got some basic diagrams on how to do it you can even make it quite uh, realistic with scenery and like a building and stuff so we'll probably do something similar but if you click on the if you go back and then click on the images tab um, it brings up a whole load of photos on people that have already done this Okay, and there are loads of people that have already done this and they've done a really good job. But I thought I'd do it because it sounds really cool. It's definitely something I want to do. So I thought I'd show you me doing it as well. And so basically every video starts with good old pen and paper and I just I just I just um scribble down ideas. So I talk about the fact that it's gonna be engage, um, I talk about location. Like, where am I going to do it? Uh, what materials am I going to use? And then I sort of like plan the vids. So let's, let's uh, for example, let's make it like um, a six parter or something. And so part one could be the introduction. And that could be short, like five or ten minutes. Part two could be the materials. 
uh, in order to do it. Uh, three could be the rolling stock. So taking a look at the wagons you're going to use, and the, as well as the locomotive, the shunter. Like, is it going to be a? Um, well, you, you can start to like brainstorm ideas. So like, you can put shunter in the middle, and then off that comes you know class 03, 06, 08, maybe even a Jinty if I'm going to set it in like a certain period. And so basically you just, you brainstorm, you just, and before you know it, you've got reams and reams of ideas and notes to go off. And that is how every single ICH2 video starts. I'm, I'm honest, not lying, that is, the, that is the truth. Every single video you've seen, so the Engage project where we had the M&Ms going around the office, that started out like this. Even a review, it's like even if I'm doing a review, um, so for example, if I'm doing like, uh, well you've just seen me do the class 37, the DCC sound, so I like class 37, and then I talk about, um, well, something I'll do is I'll like, I'll go to the internet again, and I'll do like, um, I'll do a Google search for, uh, come on, we have here, so like a class uh, 37, class 37, go. And then usually, as you can see, the top page to come up is the Wikipedia entry, and then, so I browse through this, I read through all this, I get a whole load of facts from the side. They're not always 100% accurate, but they're usually about 80 and 90% accurate, and I'll sometimes cross-reference cross cross -reference these facts and these details with other sources, such as the Colin J. Marsden series. You must have heard of him. He's the guy that brings out all the locomotive books and the stuff, and... Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. So I'll sometimes cross-reference cross stuff to make sure that I've got facts as accurate as I can. I'll basically grab little bits of info from here, and then I put them into my plan. So like, um, if there's, I mean, this isn't true, but say there was something really cool about the Class 37, like say, uh, the Queen uh, named one in crew. Um in 1978. I mean that's not true. <laughs> I've totally made that up. Sorry Queen if you're watching. <laughs> um, but I will I will make a note of it so that I don't forget it and then I'll even draw like a little line and talk about uh, TI which is time index. Like when am I gonna talk about this? Uh, I'm gonna try and talk about it before the five minute mark or something. And then maybe I'll um, be talking about the model on how there's maybe a massive chip inside of model. Maybe it's been damaged or something. And then maybe I want to put that at a time index of about eight minutes. Uh, total video is not to exceed 22 minutes or something, which is, that's, that's my shorthand for do not greater than 22 minutes. Um, so, this is this is how a review starts out, you know, this is what I do for every single video and very often the notes are so comprehensive and so detailed that I hang on to these and I keep them at the side of the filming all along. So the next thing I start to do is I'll do some practice runs in the conservatory. Okay, so hey, and um, this is going to be really weird because look, <laughs> I've got Craig to film this bit for me on my phone, on my new smartphone, and this is the camcorder that I use for 99% of the ICH2 videos. We, there is a really big hefty one that we do sometimes borrow for certain videos, and then every now and again you'll see footage taken on something else, like a smartphone or another camcorder. But usually this is what I do most of the video work with. So say I'm doing a review. Um, these are the two tripods that I use. They're nothing fancy. Um, basically, this is one that I think Craig used to use years ago, and it's a Hammer uh, Alpha 60. So it really is probably time I should upgrade now, but it does a perfectly good job. Um, I always, always do the same thing every time. So I grab the camcorder. Uh, I do usually have the screen closed, actually. I find the, the, uh, the little locating pin, screw it into the base, and then, because 
of doing reviews and stuff, say, um, well, this is the Class 37 packaging, I then have to flip the screen out, and I have to sort of crouch like this, and then I have to get the angle just right, so I have, I'm like conscious of the light, um, and I can adjust blinds, I can switch lights on, switch lights off, according to how much light I've got in the subject area where I'm filming. So then I'll start to practice, I'll put like the box down in sharp, and then, oh no, it's not right. So I bring the tripod back, move it to the side, tilt up, tilt down, zoom in, zoom out. And the tripod can also extend, so you can extend all the legs and make it go higher, they can go even higher still. It's really, really good, I definitely recommend one, but it's so big that it's useless when it comes to close-up shots uh, and getting shots at a sort of track level. And so for that, it's time to close it all up again, unscrew it, and then I literally have to switch to a small and compact little tripod. I got this from Stockport, there's a telescope shop just in Stockport, south of Manchester, they sell millions of different tripods, usually for telescopes, but obviously they sell them for binoculars and camera equipment as well. So with this tiny little one, even this can extend. And so with this and this, I've got a huge range of different heights that I can use for all my filming. And every time you see me put a loco on the track, um, it's this, it's this tripod that's in use. This tiny little one. On the lowest setting, it's just screwed into the bottom of the camcorder like that, or the bottom of the digital camera, or whatever camera we're using. And then just fold all the legs out, rest that on the ground, fold the screen out, get the angle right, get the height right, make sure the level of light is correct, and then go. I hit the button, start recording, do a little test demo, make sure I'm happy with the loco, make sure the track is clean. There is so much stuff to do in the background that you don't ever see, which is why um, a like a 20 minute video can actually take about four to six hours to do, you know, just a 20 minute video. And then we switch it off again. And as for those shots where, um, you know, like when a, a train has just been launched and it goes off down this side of the, the loop, um, as you can see my HST fleet here at the moment, or, or part of it, but whenever you see a, a I say like this, give it some juice, okay, that's the famous line, let's give it some juice, and off it goes. You probably already worked it out, but it actually does an entire loop before you see the next bit. Um, in fact, sometimes it'll do several loops. If I'm running the train in, it'll do half an hour in here of running around before you actually see the filming again. And then I'll get a, so say that the loco has just gone around this bend and it's come all the way down here. And as you can see the class 37 is still here from the other day. If I want footage of the class 37, you know, thundering past here, um, I then have to grab the camcorder, grab the tripod, set everything up over just like, like that, fold the screen out, check I'm happy with the settings, check I mean, even that looks pretty cool. Um, and then I have to stay out of shot. I have to make sure there's nothing in the reflection. I'll let it thunder past. Um, hope that that footage is okay. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you get a derailment. Sometimes you notice there's a dead spider that you missed. So you have to reposition, set everything up again, go again. And it can take <laughs> like 10 passes to get the, the one perfect shot. But it's worth it, because um, you can load all of that into the editing suite, which you'll see in a bit, and you can make it look professional. I think it's worth putting that time and effort in, because I think the rewards are definitely there. The video looks better. So once all the footage is gathered, and I'm happy with everything, I've got all the shots, and it's time to go edit. So let's switch back to this device, and then I'll show you where all of the, all of the magic happens. Uh, wake up, wake up, wake up! This is the main computer. This is where I do most of the editing. Um, in fact, you can see here that we've still got all the details um, on the screen from the previously uploaded video. But basically, um, this, is the, this is the main computer that does the editing. 
It's only an Intel i3 with about 6 or 8 gig of RAM. Um, crucially, it has a massive, massive hard drive that I can just show you if I go into computer. You can see here that we've got four big drives. So that's the SSD which has got Windows on, that's full of all my programs and games, music only, and then this is basically ICH2. So that's all of the ICH2 stuff um, over here. And then I have a folder structure. So ICH2 Earth is called ICH2 Earth because there's also an ICH2 Cloud folder for everything that I need access to from my phone and my Ultrabook. Um, but basically this is full of the huge video files. So Series 7 has a raw folder and it has an encoded folder. And then in the raw folder you can see where all of the raw bits of footage get dropped. And then once they've been edited they get transferred to the encoded folder ready for upload. Okay, so this is just my desktop, don't worry about it, it is a bit messy, but trust me, it has, um, there is a point to it all. <laughs> um, it's an organised mess, but yeah, generally it's not too bad. And so I start everything with a video template. So if I just double click this, you can see that Adobe Premiere Pro loads up as CS5. To be honest, there's barely any difference between CS4, CS5 and CS6, and there's probably even a CS7 now, I don't know. Um, but they all pretty much do the same thing. So as you can see here on the screen, this is just the basic, um, this is the timeline here at the bottom, this is where all of the magic happens, literally this is where I do all of my editing. Um, I was going to show you that, I was going to show you editing for like the Inglenook video, or maybe this video, I can't remember now, but um, seeing as we already have a project in here that actually needs removing, I might as well just start doing some demonstrations with that for you. So over here on the left, this massive list, are all the, these are all the video files. So it's simply a case of right clicking, selecting import, and then you search through your computer to import those video files that you've just recorded. Once they're imported and um, Premiere Pro has conformed the audio, which basically means it's just gone through and scanned the recording levels, um, you can literally drag one of the video clips down onto one of these timelines, such as that, and then you can select a video clip, you can select a certain moment of the video clip, like this, and you go over to here, you grab your tools, you start slicing stuff up, like that, and then you can grab a piece and move it somewhere else, you can delete a bit that you totally don't need at all, and then, you know, like, to make it professional, say you want to put some transitions on the end here, you go over to the left, you select video effects, sorry, not uh, video effects, video transitions, you go to dissolve or 3D motion, let's put a tumble away on that particular clip, and you can see that it, it does that for you, so if I just hit play, there we go, <laughs> trust me, it's a bit of a mess at the moment, um, I'm just showing you exactly what happens. So this is the editing suite, this is the editing stage, and this can take hours, this can take days. For videos that are really complicated, like Craig's APT project, the editing process can take days. You can have so many different elements, like bits of music, bits of video clip, bits of artwork, that it gets really, really complicated. My biggest tip to you would be to save often. <laughs> just in case your computer crashes, just in case there's a power cut, because you definitely don't want to lose all that hard work. Once you're happy with everything, once you're happy with the entire project, the ending is on. Just like that. Just hit that subscribe button. You've got the music in place, for watching. everything works. It's basically back up to the top, go to file, go to export, export media, and then this is where all of your encoding settings come up. And this is really important too. You can see that I've got this set. <laughs> this is called the Willsy setting 1080p. Basically, this is a very customized um, set of uh, specifics for my particular videos. They're very YouTube friendly. It's the H.264 format, which YouTube loves. YouTube absolutely loves that format. Um, I don't have any 4K camera equipment yet, and if I did, I would obviously have to deal with that and the file sizes would be much bigger. But currently we work with 1080i, the camcorder films in 720p or 1080i, which stands for interlaced. And then what happens in Premiere Pro is that it cheats and turns the 1080i into 1080p. 
um, but it works it's fine the file sizes are reasonable um, about a 20 minute review starts out at about 4 gig and then after Premiere Pro it's about a gig and that's what gets uploaded to YouTube so it's definitely worth it definitely worth it and once I'm happy with all the settings I'm happy with the format the size the frame rate I just click Q in the bottom and then it exports it to the media encoder it sits there waiting to be done and once I'm happy I click start and jobs are good <laughs> it's nerve it's nerve-wracking because that's when a crash could happen, that's when something could go wrong, or if you've spelt something badly, or if you've got an entire clip, basically you've got to decide whether it's worth doing it again, or whether to just leave it. And it's 50-50. Sometimes I'll just leave it, and sometimes I will literally cancel and start again. Um, and then once it's encoded, um, I go into the ic 2 Earth folder, I go into Series 7, I go to the encoded, I select the particular video, and then I just upload it. I literally drag and drop that to YouTube. So on my YouTube channel like this, I go to the upload page. Um, and then once that's there, I literally grab the video and then I drag it to the Chrome. I always use Chrome. I find it the best browser to use. And then I let go, um, just like that. And it's gonna upload now. But no, don't, cancel. <laughs> Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> um, and then I'll often, like a day or two later, I'll go to, um, I'll go to the YouTube channel. I'll go into the video manager like this and then I'll go and check on the video and see how many views it's got, see how many comments have been made and then basically check the analytics just to see what sort of data YouTube is telling me about, you know, the latest video or um what people are enjoying, what people are hating and and then I'll start work on the next video. So, in a, in a nutshell, and it is a very, very compact nutshell, that is basically what goes on behind the scenes. So, as you can see, I've started to plan the Ingle Nut project for you. I'm really looking forward to that one. I can't wait for that because it should be so quirky and so cool. And I love Engage stuff. Um, but if you found this video interesting and you want to know more, if you want to see more, if you want to see more stuff in detail about the editing, about the music I use, maybe about the camera equipment, um, or if you would like a 100% behind the scenes, so like literally Craig or Lisa film the entire thing and you see everything from behind the camera, then do tell me, let me know, leave a comment, get in touch via Twitter or Facebook and if there's enough demand I'll do it. Um, but I hope that this has given you just a tiny sneak preview, a little peek into what goes on behind the scenes and why every single ICH2 video takes hours, sometimes days to make because every video is made with love, every video is made with care and attention and I do my best to make it as professional and as cool for you guys as possible. Sometimes I do make mistakes though. I'm only human, um, but I do the best I can, and the most important thing is I enjoy it. I really enjoy doing it, and I, I totally do not recommend making anything on YouTube unless you enjoy it. You have to enjoy doing what you do, and I do, and part of the reason is you guys, it's you folks out there. Um, you really enjoy the videos, you give me tons of ideas, you really help me out with technical things that I get stuck on. Um, like with the last Engage project, you helped so much. So um, I'm hoping you're going to be able to help me out with this new one too. And when we carry on with IC82, IC82 Hilford, the proper layout, it's just called Hilford by the way. Um, again, I'm going to need your input. I know loads of you have already done it and you've done fantastic jobs. So I'm going to need your help for a change. <laughs> um, anyway. It's time for me to go have some dinner. It's time for me to get this uploaded. Thank you so much for sticking with me all these years. Um, tons and tons of content to come up, as you know. About a megaton of mail to open. Not to mention the new Engage project, my proper Hilford layout, loads of reviews, and some really exciting stuff to do with Hornby, Batman and Hattons as well. <sighs> so yeah. 
lots coming up. Time to go crack on. Ah, and I'm knackering in my right arm now. Ow. This train terminates here. Please ensure that you take all your belongings with you when you leave the train. Thank you for traveling with us today. Hey peeps, I hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to leave a comment, please give it a like, and if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Thanks for watching.